Okay, everybody here speaks English? Yes. Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> I'll do my best to speak English. I hope you understand. So, first, oh, I know what I wanted to do. I want to take a picture of you first. That's my first job. Okay, so just. You want a selfie? No, I want a picture of you guys. Here, so I got you. Okay, I got this side. Smile. One, two, three. Gotcha. And this side. Okay, let me get this side first. Okay. All right. And then the corner here. You got good ideas. Okay. All right. Okay, here we are. Shut my cell phone off. Um, fr from the back, maybe, I don't know, but I don't want to impose upon you. Okay, well, I'll, I'll let you decide. So, I'm really delighted to be here today, and I'm glad we got a little chance to talk before my lecture starts. And Mark, Mark Donfield is not here, but I'll thank him, and I want to introduce you and thank um, the chair of Have Art Will Travel's Advisory Council, Susanna Ginsberg, please stand a second, who is at the forefront of our programs, and you're going to love our programs once you hear all about it. And I also want to thank and introduce Dr. Ann Holt, who's an art educator, and Holt's executive manager. And uh, I want to thank her for all her expertise and effort on behalf of our educational initiative. Thank you. So I'm here today to talk about Holocaust heroes, fierce females. Are you ready for this? <laughs> and to talk about the power of art, the power of art. Now, some of you have witnessed a lot of global horrors, maybe on just on the news TV program, maybe in person. But I'm here to say that art can start a conversation about empathy for the other, right? I mean, that's probably why a lot of you are here. Empathy for the other, the disdained other, the other that people don't want on their shores, in their workplaces, and certainly not in their homes. So I'm representing Have Art, Will Travel. You said it perfectly which we call HOT, H-A-W-T for short, HOT. And it addresses issues including racism, sexism, ableism, classism, homophobia, all the isms. And it's the umbrella organization through which two traveling exhibitions and educational initiatives, one called Holocaust Heroes on the left, one called the Fluidity of Gender, on the right, and they've now been going to more than 30 national and international venues along with our educational initiative. Come in. So art allows us a way, I don't know, how many artists are out there? Any, anybody? What? An artist? Another one? Anyone else? An artist? Visual art? Right? Any dancers? Any, any other kind of artists here? Okay. So you know that art allows us a way to begin a discussion about gender justice, bullying, and oppression. That's what we're going to talk about today. And it's a powerful way, even a fun way, where participants can let down their hair, we're all for that, right? And kind of get into a different internal space and allow their minds to explore and reimagine another self sometimes, another identity, and perhaps one that's a little bit more risk-taking and self-sacrificing. They could try on a new avatar, I call it, and body swap with my wearable sculptures into the role 
we hope of the brave upstander. Have you ever heard that term, upstander? It's a new term that's gathering more and more momentum. So I'm going to ask you now to try mind swapping with me for a moment, okay? We're going to see how creative you are. Imagine yourself now somewhere else. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. You're fast asleep and suddenly awakened by a loud knock. So half asleep, you kind of drag yourself to the door. You open the latch a little bit, peek out, and before you is a person in rags, looking close to death, saying, please, let me in your house. If they don't get me, if you let me in your house, I'll be safe. If you don't let me in your house, they're going to kill me. I have to hide. So quick, what do you do? Do you say yes? And you know that if you say yes and the authorities find out, then you risk not only you, but your parents, your siblings, your friends, your neighbors might be murdered. What do you do? So most people close the door and say no. But some, a few, a very few, open the door, let the person in. These are the rescuers we're going to talk about today. These are the people who protect the vulnerable, giving thought to neither their own safety nor bravery, hardly considering themselves heroes at all. These are the ones who would say years later, I could have done nothing else. It was the only humane thing to do. So often I know, for me, in the comfort of my home or my art studio or out on an outing, I think, what, what would I do in a situation like this? Would I be a rescuer, a brave upstander? Or would I be an onlooker, a bystander who notices victimization but then continues concentrating on just my day? I'm not sure. Can any of us be sure, really, except those who have faced it. So the question is, what defines bravery? What makes a hero? Now consider another situation. You've been really fabulous so far. Now let's go to one other situation. You imagine yourself being kept cap captive in a prison, OK? And you're treated so despicably that the simple everyday spoon, the spoon becomes a vital tool of survival. Well, I think from here, I'm going to let this short film continue telling my story. Have Art Will Travel just completed it. The story starts with a spoon, a simple spoon. A man comes over to a woman in a concentration camp with a spoon and gives it to her. He looks at her and says, when can we meet? So she knows that the gift is in exchange for sexual favors. As they passed around that filthy urn with watery gruel, it was known that tuberculosis germs were on that rim. Anyone with a spoon that could dip into the middle of the urn felt protected in a way. She throws the spoon at him spontaneously, not thinking, and then realizes, my God, what did I do? He's going to hurt me. So she runs away and hides. But Instead, he takes a spoon and brings it over to another woman. She takes it and says yes. What would you do in a situation like this? How do you keep your self-respect and survive? persecution and protection. The spoon became a metaphor for me. 
I use the shell also as a metaphor for power versus vulnerability. Our culture is a bullying kind of culture. So I've coined the four B's. The four B's are the bully, there's the bullied. The person who just sits around doing nothing when something bullied, which is called the bystander. Most people are bystanders. The bystander doesn't help. Bully, bully, bystander, and the brave upstander. Brave upstander. The brave upstander. <laughs> person that ends up standing up anyway. It's really being a fighter. It's being a fighter for right. Bullies are scared. All they need to do is be approached and they can be stopped. Kids have natural empathy unless it's shamed or beaten out of them. The good news about being human is that we're adaptable. So the species survives. And the bad thing about being human is that we're adaptable. So if we are put in a group in which violence is normalized, we think it's normal. It is very clear that the Holocaust would not have been possible but for individuals who started off their lives as bullies and then took that mindset to a horrific conclusion. The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, Chapter 11, The Rape of Austria. The ultimate bully, the ultimate terrorist, was Hitler during the Holocaust. However, it is very clear in the context of the horrors that were being perpetrated. It was possible not to lose one's humanity. It was possible to not just survive, but to survive and to help others. I would like every child to know the name of Ruth Gruber. And Frank, Victor Tepner, Norpon, Zivia Lubetkin, Nadezda Popova, Hadassah Rosensoft. Hanna Senesh, Gertrude Luckner, Nancy Wake. These are the 10 women that represent different aspects of bravery during the Holocaust. Some chose to enter into the military, some became journalists, some became diarists. Dear King. They took men and they brought them into hiding places. They had 600 Jews that they transported from the ghetto to the woods so that they could fight against the Germans. My mother kept 149 Jewish children alive in what became known as a children's home. What I can remember is people coming up to my mother saying, Dr. Binko, you don't remember me, but you saved my life. I read that and I think, oh, I hope I would have been here. I just hope I would have had the moxie and the originality. It just makes me crazy when I see situations of huge unfairness. I mean, you can use what you do to, to right the balance a little bit. Art induces people to think about things, to, most importantly, experience things. If there is artwork where you see individuals who were able to stand up to malevolent authority, it makes everyone question, would I have had the courage to stand up and do the right thing? We each have inside ourselves bravery that we may not have even tapped into. Courage and bravery is not the lack of fear. It's proceeding in spite of it. So I ask, what would it take for you to be an upstander rather than a bystander? <laughs> you have to be fierce. So that's our film as we just completed it maybe a couple of weeks ago.
people, if you'd like to come in, please, there are, there are seats over here. You, you're welcome to come in. There are plenty of seats inside. You took a long coffee, I know. You missed a lot of good stuff, but there's still some more good stuff to come. Anybody else want to come in at this point? So you have to be fierce, right? Fierce? I struggled long and hard on that word. Some have asked me, oh, don't choose it as the title for your exhibition. It means violence and killing. But I don't mean it that way when I use the word fierce. I define it as having intensity, being fervent, powerful, forceful, ardent, impassioned, fevered, strong, as in a fierce defender. I connect the word with a hunger for something, a desire to take action, do the right thing, stand up for an idea, right or wrong. Can we speak of Anne Frank? A child in a real life Kafka-esque nightmare as being fierce? I, th I think we can. Bravely, she went about her daily chores in the face of such horrific brutality. Fiercely, she pursued her writing, and it grounded the influence her words had on so many. In fact, reading the diary of a young girl was my first introduction to the Holocaust and World War II. And then there's the word hero. I think I'm once in a while coming in to the thing, the word hero. So why did I choose that word? Some people said, oh no, you mean heroine. You don't mean hero when you describe the 10 females. But to answer that, you have to understand that in my head, a little bit crazy, but in my head, the only one I have, a kind of movie clip goes on. And that movie clip when I think of the word heroine, imagines a scenario in which the fragile girl is tied to the railroad tracks, screaming for help as the train is fast approaching, only to be saved by the gallant lads or lad who unties her just in the nick of time. The gal being saved is always the heroine. The lad doing the saving is always the hero. I could not let this stereotype stand for my 10 brave females. Indeed, each of them is a hero. And then you might ask, are you asking? I don't know. Where does my obsession with this theme of protection come from? For me, it's particularly vivid in my mind since running for an entire day from ground zero where my art studio is during 9-11. And that day's search for safety brought up recurring dreams I had as a kid where I was always running. The entire dream I had over and over was running from different bad guys. Sometimes they were in planes, sometimes they were running by foot, but they always were trying to hurt me. People have different recurring dreams. Some think of themselves as having to be outside nude or something, or they can't get to the exam on time or something. Any of you have any recurring dreams as a kid? You don't want to admit it. So at night, you do? OK. <laughs> so it seems like a natural progression for me from my nightmare and 9-11 running for protection to World War II and the Holocaust where protection was in such short supply. And I can't stop reading everything about it I could get my hands on. And I know it'll take me my entire life probably to study it without ever coming even close to understanding how people could have done this to other human beings. So let's look at the 10 heroes I chose to represent in these um, tapestries. The tapestry is square. The camera is elongating this a little bit, but I think we could deal with it. You'll see superheroes, pop culture, and religious icons in the tapestries. And they're there to help start conversations about strength and power and comparisons between real life fantasies and 
real life people and fantasies. So Anne Frank is the most well known. She died in 1945 before she could live out 16 years. Here you see details from my tapestries. They're five foot square. Now allow me to coax your imagination a little bit again. Let me introduce you if you don't know Nausicaa. How many know Nausicaa? Okay. She is a protagonist from an anti-war anime who's committed to love and understanding, especially when she calmly talks down an aggressive monster and turns him around and has him go home without hurting anyone. Now, would that we could talk to some of the des despots around the world and have them just turn around and go home. I think Anne Frank would have liked Nausicaa. Anne Frank represents with her diary of Anne Frank, diary of a young girl it was called, the many brave girls during this period and exemplifies the loss and legacy of 1.5 million Jewish children murdered during the time of the Holocaust. And I include Meep Gies with her. Now, Meep Gies you probably never heard of. A lot of these heroes you never even heard of. She was entrusted by Otto Frank, Anne Frank's father, to run the business and provide food, news reports, protection and comfort to those hiding in that middle building above the Frank business in Amsterdam. I include her mother, her father, her sister, and I include the girl with the dragon tattoo, Elizabeth Salander. Storm, do you know her? She's a superhero from X-Men comics and uh, Wonder Woman, but only from 1941 to 47. And you don't know her, I know she, you know. So Salander, I think, adds much to our study of gender and power. And Storm, for those that don't know her, is known for compassion. And Wonder Woman, now, I think is as good as pop culture gets for a superhero that never kills. And Lady Gaga, she's just all activism, right? So these pop culture icons get the attention of not only my younger audiences, but my older audiences too. And I think they paved the way for learning about women like Ruth Gruber, an American photojournalist, writer, and humanitarian. And you know, Ruth Gruber is still alive. You know how old she is? 104 years old. She's still alive. And as a special assistant to Secretary of the Interior, Harold Ickes, she had a secret mission in 1944. And that mission was to accompany a thousand traumatized, and you can imagine how traumatized they were, Jewish refugees aboard a military ship called the Henry Gibbons taking them from Italy to Oswego, New York. Now, Franklin Delano Roosevelt issued the invitation by executive order, and he was able to circumvent our Congress and their refusal to lift the quota on Jewish immigrants. My God, how could we not think of the refugees and migrants all over the world struggling to be allowed into any country where they can feel safe? Vita Kempner was a leader of the armed resistance in the United Parson Partisan Organization in the Vilna Ghetto of Poland. She fought alongside founder Abba Kovna, whom she later married. Now, of the two, he was the poet. He was the articulate orator who said, let us not go like sheep to the slaughter. That's very remembered. But she was the saboteur, fearless in combat, she was the first woman to play a role in blowing up a Nazi train. Over and over, she stole into the ghetto and out of the ghetto to deliver and get secret messages. And when caught by an SS man, she always got away by pretending that she was not Jewish, she was just a Polish woman who lost her way. Where am I? How do I get back home? Nor in Yat Khan a special operations executive agent. She became the first female radio operator to be sent from Britain to aid the French resistance. For a while, she was the only radio operator in occupied Paris. 
Her father, I mean, this is just an unbelievable story. Her father was from a noble Indian Muslim family. She was sometimes called the spy princess because she was the descendant of an 18th century ruler of the kingdom of Mysore in southern India. She could have lived out her life in luxury. She had everything, instead choosing to support the war effort as a radio operator. Once she was caught by uh, a superior on the radio, and she swiftly used her brain, turned the situation around by telling him, oh, I must listen to my jazz. She didn't tell him she was sending secrets on the radio. I must listen to my jazz. Please don't take the BBC away from me. Don't take the radio. Don't let them take it from me. Despite her success, she was eventually caught, imprisoned, and executed. How old? 30 years old. She might have liked Lady Gaga, who incidentally launched an anti-bullying um, foundation at Harvard University. Zuba, Z Zivia Lubeckin, names you never heard of even, a leader of the Polish Jewish underground in Nazi-occupied Warsaw. She was the founder and the only woman in high command of the ZOB resistance group and one of the leaders of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. She was one of 34 fighters, one of 34, to survive the war and help the surviving group get this through the sewers of Warsaw to safety. She testified as a witness in the 1961 Eichmann trial in Jerusalem. Zivia Lubeckin might have been a fan of Wonder Woman, who's my main superhero. Unlike Lubeckin, Wonder Woman used magic wrist bracelets, lasso, invisible plane, without ever killing. That's why I like Wonder Woman. She did all this without ever killing to defeat the villains. Zubekin had no such luck, no wrist bracelets. So how about we'll travel referencing fantasy and religious icons and real life heroes discusses leadership as exemplified by this woman, Gertrude Luckner, who led the Freiburg Catholics in Germany with money she received from the Archbishop. We have the Pope now in town. She smuggled out Jews over the Swiss border and delivered messages from the beleaguered Jewish community. And after the war, Luckner devoted herself to furthering understanding between Jews and Christians. She might have related to Kanon, the Buddhist deity of mercy and protection. Anybody know Kanon? Buddhist deity of mercy and protection, whom people turn to to seek sol solace. Nadezda Popova, one of the first military pilots of the Soviet Union. She was highly decorated with awards including the title of Hero of the Soviet Union, the Gold Star Medal, and three orders of the Red Star. Known as a night witch, she looked, she flew, look what she flew, she flew this rickety, dinky, wooden plane, bombing hostile territory. I think Popova would have related to Storm, known for her courage and compassion in ridding the world of danger. Hadissa Bimko Rosensoft was a dentist. You never hear about these women. Because of her medical training, she was assigned to work in the Jewish infirmary at Auschwitz. There she helped rehabilitate thousands of survivors. I won't forget her testimony at the Eichmann trial. She described a pregnant woman, a woman, visualize this, made to lie on the floor while a Nazi officer stomped on her belly until she and the baby were dead. You saw her son Menachem Rosenstopped in this short film just before. He must be very proud of his mother. As you see, I combine an amalgam of materials in my tapestries, leather, texture, fabrics, metals, paints, and mixed media. I use buckles and zippers, badges and medallions, tool parts, stones. Here you see even shoelaces and boot parts. Items that I feel form the fabric and traces of our civilization and society. Hannah Senesch, as one of 37 Jews from mandatory Palestine, was parachuted 
by the British Army into Yugoslavia during the Second World War, regarded as a national hero in Israel, where her poetry is widely known. She was arrested at the Hungarian border, imprisoned, tortured, but she refused to reveal details of her mission. She told them nothing. She was executed by firing squad. You know how old? 23 years old. Senesh may have felt a kinship with Princess Mononoke, an anime character who was determined to save the environment. Anyone know Princess Mononoke? The Holocaust hero that first inspired me, this is interesting, was Nancy Wake. She became a leading figure in the French resistance while serving as a British agent. She was one of the Allies' most decorated service women in, woman in the war. As a reporter, she never forgot seeing Jews. You know, everything kind of inspires us to become what we end up becoming. She, she never forgot seeing Jews brutally beaten on the streets of Berlin when she was a reporter. And later, when she lived as a grand dame in France with a villa and her fabulously wealthy husband and parties every night in Paris in their magnificent home, she gave it all up to fight in the trenches, to go into the trenches and bring hundreds of Jews to safety by taking them through the French Alps. Now, I don't know your backgrounds. I don't know if you come from great wealth, but I imagine some of you really want to do something, want to do something to change the world. And that's how these women I think felt. Every one of us. What? I think every one of us I, I, I would love to think course. that of you. That's what it gives me the chills to think really that you Because we are here to change the world and to learn, to learn every, uh, That's the best. Culture. We are here to change the world. I love that. I'm so glad I'm here. Mm -hmm. It's hard to believe that this woman now actually apologized, get this, for having to be pushed when parachuting from a, uh, a plane. She was embarrassed and she told us, you know, I just couldn't jump by myself. I needed someone to push me. So in summary, these 10 tapestries com comprise just one part of Have Art Will Travel's three-part traveling exhibition. Comes with an educational component, but the exhibit itself has three parts. One part is the tapestries. The second part really takes a lot of imagination, but having heard that story in the film, I could tell you that each one of these abstract boxes that go and travel, 20 of them travel, have a spoon and have shells to represent the mask that the people in these prisons had to wear to survive. Elie Wiesel describes sitting in a concentration camp while his father is being beaten brutally and having to just sit there with this shell of a mask on his face, trying not even to blink, not look, and absolutely not able to do anything because if he even moved, they would hurt him the way they were hurting his father. Power and vulnerability and the conundrum of helplessness faced by these victims is what this traveling exhibit and educational initiative is all about. The third part of the e exhibition just has one sculpture with a Wonder Woman shadow. Once again, it's a little squashed. It's much longer than you see here. With a um, a desire to represent the fierceness and strength of the protector. This exhibition and its educational events are now, as you see, in Miami. Anybody going to be in Miami until November 21st? It's in Miami. Are you going? I would love to be able to. Okay. Go. Well, I'm sorry, Have Art Work Travel cannot afford to pay for your plane fare, <laughs> but you're welcome to go. It'll travel to Boca Raton, Santa Barbara, Manhattan, Milwaukee, beyond. We hope to go abroad early in 2017, and maybe there's a place, a venue in your country, in your state, that might like to have us come there so we could exchange cards after the talk.
So Have Art Will Travel's educational initiative includes an international team of scholars, and Anne is one of the scholars on that team, planning a curriculum on ho Holocaust heroes, fierce females, to be housed at Penn State University. You are from Pennsylvania. You're affiliated with the U of Pennsylvania, right? Am I right? Which one? No, Minnesota. Minnesota. Well, I was close. <laughs> we have a book and a documentary in the works also. We work with all ages, travel everywhere, and welcome audiences to our loft in Tribeca. You know where Tribeca is? Downtown Manhattan. We know, of course, that typical heart participants will unlikely face genocidal scenarios. Their need for protection probably won't be life-threatening. Hopefully yours won't either. Their confrontation with evil will not be of a Hitlerian murderer. But we have heart, at heart see persecution on a continuum starting with everyday bullying. Almost everyone comes in contact with that on a daily basis, whether it's cruelty in the form of ostracism, humiliation, or just plain harassment. That's what we like to start with. We like to see people see this on the continuum of what happens in the elevator, on the streets, you know, in, in the lunchroom at school. And we inspire people to take these mundane opportunities to show their mettle, to stick up for the victim, as I hope all of you are really working to do, trying to do. As we see it, people can take on one of four roles. The bully, the bullied, the bystander, and the brave upstander. I call them the four Bs. We possibly have taken each of these roles. The role of the brave upstander is the most important one. So in conclusion, art is always at the beginning as we discuss these issues. We ask our visitors to reinvent and visualize bravery for themselves, to look at the armor they wear, the safety they seek. Art is helpful, as with these Hetrick Martin students making masks about gender and bullying. They wore them to our loft and they posed for each other with their cell phones, but then we sat around on a table and we talked a little bit and one girl, when asked how come she made the 3D squiggle on the right cheek of her mask, said, oh yes, I planned that squiggle. That wasn't accidental. Why, we asked? She said, because if a knife comes at me, that silver squiggle will prevent the knife from cutting into my eye. And then she talked about growing up in her family. And this is what we're about. They come for the art, but we awe them with the facts. You know the information, so I don't have to repeat it today, but do you know this fact? Art teaches us. It opens minds and encourages a meaningful exchange of ideas. It starts personal conversations to expand the continuum between masculinity and femininity, to include both power and vulnerability, softness and strength, with empathy for the different one, that's what you hear, the other, the main focus. We talk about transgender, our bullying society, the sexual assaults that go on and on, women in uniform who have to line up with their rapists right beside them. Kids and adults from small towns, even in the U.S., don't necessarily know about it. They need to know about the repeated rapes of the unconscious 16-year-old in Steubenville, Ohio lugged from party to party like a sack of potatoes. Have Art Will Travel asks, why did no one stick up for this girl at the time? Sure, some pr protested when word got out, but why was there no hero at the scene? No one who stood up for the victim. Hart's goal is to find, educate, and develop tomorrow's brave upstanders. We take on difficult topics and we have fun doing it. Some of you took pictures of this vest. We use the bully-proof vest to start conversations. Kids come to brainstorm what it takes to make a leader, and the tapestries and sculptures are where our discussions begin. Two more slides. 
Coming to New York from every part of the world, people talk about bullying and bigotry in their own countries. Within this safe art space, and maybe some of you want to intern in our art space, we could talk about that. They imagine what they can do on an everyday personal level, as well as on a community level and beyond. They, vo they voice their desires, concerns, fears, like you have, desires, concerns, fears about helping people around the world. Some body swap with sculptures, as did the two girls on the right, but they all express their eagerness, as you did, to make their marks on society. So art can help to inspire people to be brave upstanders. We just have to have empath empathy, and along with empathy, we just have to be, what, fierce. Thank you. Thank you.